Thank you very much, Brother Nathan, and good morning, brothers and sisters. Thank you for braving the, the cold. Well, I think it's cold anyway, being a, uh, a Queenslander. Well, brothers and sisters, this is where God gives us the opportunity to sit in the driver's seat, so to speak. One of the important things about coming to know God and coming to reflect his character is that we need to know what he goes through every day for us. And what he's done by giving us the power to forgive is encouraging us to think like him. So in actual fact, he's putting a lot of control in our hands and he's saying, it's up to you, you have a go. See how you go. So we come then to this response. And this is very challenging. It is a challenging part. I find it challenging, personally, because it involves the application of all the principles we've looked at this weekend, our personal involvement. This is the part where we come to understand really what God is doing for us. And it's this, this section this morning, brothers and sisters, really is the true measure of our understanding and appreciation of what it really means to be reconciled with God. You know, we, we talk about God manifestation, reflecting God's character, and we say it's a wonderful subject to consider. And it is. It's a, it's a, a beautiful subject. It's amazing honour for human beings to have that privilege to try and act out. I say try, because we all fail miserably at this to try and act out the character who we are instinctively at enmity with. Our instincts are opposite. Even our Lord Jesus Christ's instincts were opposite to his Father's. Not my will, but thine be done. We don't like to forgive. It's contrary to our nature. We don't like to forgive and forget for those of, who have wronged us because we think, the carnal mind thinks, that they need to pay for what they've done. And we harbour things in our minds. We need, brothers and sisters, to come to an understanding that those things have to be let go. So remember our three conditions. The process that we've looked at here is the confession of sin, the repentance and the conversion. And so what, this morning, we're going to look at this, this fourth condition. So come to, come to Matthew 6. This is a critical condition. And God cannot work with us unless we involve ourselves in this process. So Matthew 6 and verse 12. Let's come in halfway through the Lord's Prayer here. Where we read... <coughs> Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And the first thing he says immediately after that prayer, for if you forgive men the trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men the trespasses, neither will or can your father forgive your trespasses. He's not in a position to forgive us because we're not forgiving others. Mark 11 says this, And when you stand praying, forgive. If you have aught against any, that your father also which is in heaven may forgive your trespasses. Again, God wants to forgive us. He awaits our response. But if you do not forgive, says Mark, Neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. So you can see then that my personal forgiveness from God is conditional upon the way that I forgive others. And there is one little extra thing that we need to know here, brothers and sisters, and that's this. Remember in our last session, we saw how God was proactive, how he initiated the forgiveness, that process, wherever he could. Well, he wants us, as we sit in the, in the driver's seat, so to speak, with the controls, to do that as well. He wants us to try and initiate the process if indeed we think 
that someone has something against us. And we know that from Matthew 5. Shall we have a look at that too? Matthew 5 and verse 23. And that says this. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath aught against thee. So it's not you with the problem. Your brother has something against you. God said, Christ says here, verse 24, Leave there thy gift before the altar and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother and then come and offer your gift. Now, if both parties do this, we have success. And if one party is not doing it and the other one is, success as well. Initiate. If you think that you've been wronged or whatever it is, initiate that process. Take the initiative in saving your brother or your sister, whatever that the case may be. See, the, the spirit of God in which he would like us to, to frame our relationships, it's a desire to be, to be in fellowship with each other. That's what it is. Now, not, now that we, it's not going to be always possible, brothers and sisters, to do that. But God says, I want you to drive toward unity with your brothers and sisters whether it's on an ecclesial level or a personal level, whatever that may be, that should always be our goal. Remember an old brother said once, if we know anything about God at all, we know that he loves unity. And why is that so? Because God is one. He's not two or three. He's one God. He loves unity. He loves this cohesive spirit. So this is a major condition. This is a big condition. Now, we've just read from 1 John 4, this chapter, and we have the core motivation glaring out of, of why God does what he does. It's because of love. Love is of God. The word love appears in John's gospel and his epistles more than any other gospel or epistle in the Bible, the New Testament, because he is so focused on this concept of love. But if God loves what he creates, the converse is equally true. He hates that which he doesn't create because it's opposite to him, opposite to the way he thinks. So 1 Corinthians 13 verse 3 says this. You know this. You don't have to turn this up. It says this. Though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, now that's extreme, Paul says, if I have not love, I have nothing. I have no thing. Nothing at all. It's actually empty. That's, that's incredible, isn't it? To, to think that we could live our lives totally in the truth, but we, if we do so without love, it profits me nothing. Look how that, you think about the, the concepts of love here. Oh, there we go. Okay, so Proverbs says this. Proverbs says, hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all sins. He that covereth a transgression seeks love, but he that repeats a matter separates very friends. The contemporary English version uh, puts that, you will keep your friends if you forgive them. But you will lose your friends if you keep talking about what they did wrong. Love must be at the core of everything we do. And this self-sacrificing love, which we know is agape love, is the key to forgiving others. I will forgive you at my personal expense. That's what God is look, actually looking for. So we've got to ask the question then, as we think about this, is there a sin that God will not forgive? Well, we looked at this yesterday and we decided the answer was no. Apart from thinking that God can't forgive us, there is actually no sin that God will not forgive. He knows our thoughts, he knows our frame, he knows the frailness of our thinking, so he is prepared to cover all sins, whatever they are. Is there then a sin 
that you can't forgive? Is there a sin that you can't forgive? And in our minds, there's very grave sins and there's very small, light, light things. It's a good thing to think about. But just a word of explanation here about what he's actually got is, is, is expecting of us. So at the moment, there's only two beings in the universe that can forgive sins. That's God and his son, Jesus Christ. To forgive actual sins involves power. We know that to be true. It involves power to forgive sins. So the man that was let down, and he was, he was paralysed, he was let down through the roof. To show people their, God's power, Jesus went to the core of the problem and he forgave his sins. Now he went to the very root of the issue. He said, as far as your paralysis, paralysis is concerned, don't, don't worry too much about that. That's only a temporary ailment. I'm going to fix the real problem. And in his power, he forgave sins. The Pharisees grumbled and said, who is this that can forgive sins? Of course, he, to show the Pharisees that indeed he had that power, he went on to, to, uh, to heal the, the man that was sick of the palsy. So we need power to forgive. Power to discern the thoughts and intents of the heart. Only those two beings can do this, to forgive. To determine motives and objectives of the mind. So, so can you see that this is actually not our, our role or purpose? It's not our responsibility. We don't have that power. to dis I, You know what, brothers and sisters, I am hard-pressed to discern my own motives, let alone judge yours. So this role primarily belongs to God and now his son. So our response then is limited to forgiving the person not the morality of what they have done or haven't done. We forgive the person. Let me, let me show you. Matthew 6 says this. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. It doesn't say forgive us our sins, our debts, as we forgive the sins of those who have wronged us. It's the person that we forgive. And one more, Luke 11 verse 4, forgive us our sins for we, are, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. Can you hear that difference? We don't forgive the sin. We can't. We don't have that power, that authority to do so. Only God forgives sin, the deed done. Or the, th the wrong thought the wrong action, that, that we need to leave that to God. He's merely asking us to forgive the person. It's really important that we make that clear difference between God's work and our work because the implications are actually quite big. You see, if we're in the business of forgiving sin itself, we would need to, as God does, look and wait for confession, repentance and conversion. And that might not happen at all, or for years and years after. We can only judge after the seeing of our eyes and the hearing of our ears. And even then, even then our judgment is faulty often, in my personal experience at least. So we don't need to wait for those things, confession, repentance and conversion. It's not our job. So we can forgive, leave the sin to God. That's God's area to deal with. To deal with that individual or those individuals, whatever the case is, leave it to God. Let him work, his good work with them as well. Now I want to say this as well, brothers and sisters, that God is very, very aware of our weaknesses in this area. Now, if we have trouble with sin and we know that we're never ever going to get on top of sin in the days of our mortality, well then it's equally true that we're going to struggle with forgiveness. That's a given. We will struggle with forgiving each other. We can't forgive and forget. Well, I don't. I don't forgive and forget. I know God does because God says, I'll oh, remember thy sin, the sins no more. And we can't do that. Do you know what we do instead? We forgive and we keep remembering that we have forgiven. We remind ourselves of that fact. 
And also forgiveness between ourselves can sometimes take a lot of time because often there's a lot of damage. It can take time because of our limitations, our emotions. There are some shocking things that we do against each other. And these matters can sometimes be not an overnight fix, but matters that we need to present to God in earnest prayer, asking for strength and the foresight and foreknowledge to be able to forgive your brother or sister. We need to seek his help and rest upon his kindness that he knows our frame, just exactly how frail we are, whether that's emotionally, psychologically, spiritually, whatever it is. We are frail creatures. We are frail of mind and body. And not to think that, well, this is the end of the matter. This is, this is, this is the end of the world because I, I can't find it in myself to forgive. And I, I feel so wretched that I, maybe I should be forgiving and I'm not. Prayer, brothers and sisters. Prayer to God for strength. That you can arrive at that frame of mind where you can say, yes, I think I can just let go of this now. Because I'm so appreciative of how God continually forgives me and allows me to turn from my own iniquities. So God is very, very aware of the frailness of our own nature. It's a struggle. That's what's important to God. He needs to see us try to make a genuine effort. And it's not the end of the world if we're struggling on this matter. So maybe it's a good exercise if we are struggling with this at the moment you know, we think that we've been wronged. And we probably in some cases have been badly wronged and mistreated, maltreated. And God doesn't discount that what, what's one little bit. But can it be a good exercise then to put our grievances next to a man who is enduring a horrific crucifixion? He's hanging on a cross, utterly naked, now, this is the most moral man that ever lived. And look at him. He's hanging on this cross. He's bleeding all over. He's, and while the, the, the perpetrators are inflicting this upon him and laughing at him, he says, forgive them because they don't understand what they're doing. So you talk about physical abuse. Talk about moral abuse, mental abuse, whatever it is. How does it write next to that man? And he's asking to forgive the people whilst the very act is taking place. Not the next day or the next year, the next millennium, whatever it is. It's right then he's dealing with it in his mind. He's letting it go because he understands to hold that grudge can be so, be de so debilitating and he, he's not going to do that but if you do not forgive neither will your father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses now does that mean then we've got to race up to the person or persons that have hurt us race, you know, race up to the perpetrator, the culprit, the offender whoever it is and tell them wonderful news I forgive you is that it? Is that the answer? I don't think so. Not at all. That can actually be quite damaging in the healing process for both parties. It may well have the opposite effect because every situation is different. I think the answer, in fact, let's turn there, shall we? Matthew 18. You have a look. Here's the answer to the problem. This is where God wants us to work. So Matthew 18 and verse 35 says, So, now this is the chapter of forgiveness we've been looking at this weekend. This, so likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye, now here's the key, from your heart. Forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. That's it there. From your heart. That's where it occurs. It's in your heart where that forgiving act takes place. Not necessarily out, even out loud. So then the forgiveness of your brother and sister in the end, brothers and sisters, you know it's between 
It's between you and God. Leave God to deal with the brother or sister, friend, whoever it is. Leave, leave, leave that to God. But you forgive from your heart. And that is well pleasing to our Heavenly Father. God is looking for something from us, brothers and sisters, that is a willing spirit of forgiveness. An attitude that is merciful and kind, long-suffering, compassionate. Recognise those char characteristics? God says, in Jeremiah says this of God, Understand and know me, that I am Yahweh, which exercise loving kindness, judgment and righteousness in the earth, for in these things I delight, saith Yahweh. Some years ago I was talking to an elderly lady and I was aware that she was abused by her father when she was a little girl. And her father wasn't in the truth at that stage. And I knew it was taking its toll on her. And many, many years later, her father was baptised because of the wonderful example of her, the girl's mother and the consistent way in, in which her mother handled her life. And, and I said to this elderly sister, I said, what are your thoughts on, on all that now that he's a, a baptised brother and how have you dealt with that in your mind? And her answer was very, very logical and simple. She simply said this, the hurt is still there, so that's the consequence. The hurt is still there, but she said, with all my heart, I hope he's in the kingdom of God. With all my heart. And she never told him that because he'd passed away. So he doesn't have to know that. She had forgiven him from her heart and she wants him to be in the kingdom of God because at that point she said, I know that this whole thing will be healed. And she also said, I know that that suffering has shaped my life to become a softer person. So she understood what God was actually doing. Remember we looked at the parable of the unmerciful servant in Matthew 18. You're probably still there, which is good. Verse 27, just picking up where we left off yesterday. He loosed him and forgave him the debt. Loosed him and... <laughs> Two things, forgave the debt. And of course we saw that that was much more than he ever asked. That term, that lovely term, much more, right through Romans 5. Now here now is the proof that this servant did not in any way appreciate the gravity of his sin or indeed uh, what had been done for him. Let me just, just show you that. Just have a look at, I meant to show you this before. See the way John focuses on love, his gospel, 27, his epistle, 28. Look at the rest of the... I think John is making a point, don't you think? So here we go, verse 28. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. Now, he obviously owed something, and that's God acknowledging, yes, I know that you have actually been hurt. You have been offended, and you are hurting. I acknowledge that. A hundred pence. But he grabs him by the throat, and he says, pay me that you owe. Now, he wasn't treated like that. His Lord didn't grab him by the throat. He reasoned gently with him. Do you know what I think, brothers and sisters? I, I think it's true for all of us because God will want to test us, all of us, in this area. I think sometime or other, we all will come upon a circumstance in which God will rest, will test and our reactions to, the, to, to this uh, type of thinking. He will test us to our fellow brother or sister. Somewhere along the line, in God's purpose and providence, we will be tested in our lives. 
And at that point, we'll have to make decisions as to whether we are going to worry about the 200 pence or whether it be able to be forgiven. So think about this. When we, when we hold out against people, we sort of think about, here's a bit of a list, about perhaps some of the things that are in our minds. Maybe a financial debt. It might be an argument which has caused ill feeling. It might be gossip, misunderstandings, different opinions. And of course abuse, we've touched on that one, whether that's mental, physical, sexual abuse. They're all covered under, in, in this, this context. What about false accusation? Mocking, derision, spitting, scourging, crucifixion. All those things. There's a little room that's often in our minds where we hold that and makes us feel as if we're making that person pay for the ill done. Imagine if we were to open that door. We were able to get into the mind, your mind, walk along the corridor, and here we come to the big door, the big solid grudge door, and we open all the locks that are all around the door, and we swing the door open because we're going to clean it out. And there in the centre of the room is one solitary person. And that person is actually you. I heard a, a saying recently, and it went like this. To forgive... To, to forgive is to set the captive free and then you suddenly realise that the captive was me. That person has probably moved on or not even worried about things in some, some circumstances. And, but we lock ourselves up. If we hold grudges, we are th not only are we throwing our fellow, fellow servant in prison, we are throwing ourselves there as well. And more often than not, we, we stay there. We are imprisoning or binding our very own selves. And that's why God is now saying, I want you to forgive. Because you know what, brothers and sisters? You think about this. Just think about this little, this little fact here. If we receive forgiveness of God, who's the beneficiary? We are. I am. If I receive forgiveness from God, I'm the beneficiary. If we forgive others from the heart, who's the beneficiary? The others? No, they're not. I am. So on both counts, God is saying, you benefit yourself. And so verse 32 says, Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said to him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt. Because you asked me to. So this wicked servant here had misrepresented God. He'd misrepresented what God was all about. He had misrepresented this concept of God manifestation. He had misrepresented God in that he had just been forgiven. And he'd left God's presence. And soon after had been exactly in God's position. And had shown his brother what he thought God was. He had failed to exercise loving kindness and righteousness. He had distorted God's character to his brother and sister. Make no mistake, brothers and sisters, our understanding of forgiveness will have a direct impact on how we treat others. There is a distinct correlation between those two things. How you see God is how you will treat your brother. And if we believe God is hard and austere, reaping where he doesn't sow, then there's a very, very high chance we'll reflect that in our own lives and we'll hold out because the other people need to pay. So then this has actually gone up a notch now. This has gone to the next level. You see, this is more than just about being merciful or otherwise. This is about portraying God to one another. Now that's 
another level altogether. What a responsibility that is. O oh, thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all the debt. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? Can you hear that responsibility? We are betraying God to one another. That's what John says. John says, we all agree that no man has seen God at any time. Is that not true, says John? But if the love of God dwells in your brother, then you're looking at God. What a responsibility that is. Now this is why Matthew 18 and verse 18 says this, Verily I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So there is a counteraction. There is a correlation between those two things. Again I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they should ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. So there is a connection between how we treat each other on earth and God's response in heaven. And that's why the very next parable in Matthew 18 is the parable of the unforgiving servant. Verse 27, he is loosed. And verse 30, he's bound in prison. There's loosing and there's binding. Again, our understanding of forgiveness will have a direct impact on how we live. You know, in, in the Lord's Prayer, think about the Lord's Prayer for a moment. You know, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And we say, you know, yeah, that's, I can relate to that. I think that's fair. If God, if God expects us to forgive others, well, that's fair enough because he's forgiving us. You know, brothers and sisters, what we're saying to God, actually, we're saying to God this, forgive us $10 million as we forgive $20. That, is that fair? Can you see how it's all out of balance in our favour? And I think this is the, one of the, the core ideas of this parable. The main reason we need to forgive in our lives is so that we appreciate in a, such a small way the enormity of what God, the King of Heaven, has already done for us that we might experience that position that God is in. It's a very, very, see it, your, your ability, you, you having the control to forgive, see it as a very big privilege. It's an honour to forgive because I'm mimicking the God of heaven. What a privilege that is. This is not, we shouldn't do this grudgingly. It should be an absolute pleasure for us to forgive. You come to 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17. Let's let Paul pull this all together, this marvellous way he, he writes in, in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse, verse 17. He brings together God's reconciliation and our, if you like, the, the mirror image in which we should treat each other. Therefore, verse 17 of chapter 5, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation... I'm reading this from ESV. He's a new creation. So this is a work of God with us. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Oh, that's interesting. So now it's our turn. He's given us the doctrine of reconciliation. That is, verse 19, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting us with the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. What does an ambassador do? 
He's a representative. And he acts the same as and speaks the same language as from his country of origin. We're ambassadors for Christ. So we are representatives. God is making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. And don't see reconciliation like that. See it like that. One. That they may be one in us. Was Christ's prayer in, in, in Matthew, in John 17. So, I want you to think about now, brothers and sisters, just quickly, this occasion where Christ washed his disciples' feet and the recommendations that he left with his disciples on that occasion in relation to forgiving one another. He said, when we come to, to John, we don't find any record of the details of the Last Supper as we do in Matthew, Mark and Luke. Instead, do you know what we find? You know what John does? He deals with the absolute essence of what the emblems are all about. He puts the atonement in action. Shall we have a look at that? This is John 13 and verse 3. We'll come in there. John 13 and verse 3. This is the atonement in action. This is forgiveness. This is how it works. This is the ministration of the Son of God to those who he loved. Verse 3, John 13. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he was come from God and went to God. And I want you to notice the, the intricate detail in, in the text here. It's very interesting. It's sort of like a magnifying glass comes down onto the text. Now, let's look at this. He rises from supper, lays aside his garments, takes a towel and girds himself. Now the disciples are watching this and they're probably looking at each other going, what is he doing now? And after he'd done that, verse 5, he poured water out into a basin and he began to wash the disciples' feet one by one. And they're all probably sitting back, lounging on a, on a couch in a, in a reclined position. And he began to wipe them with the same towel wherewith he was girded. He's taking upon himself their dirt, their iniquities, their sins. He's bearing them himself. He wanted them all to know this and all of us today brothers and sisters to make no mistake about what he was doing he was bringing together two concepts and here's the concepts washing through the act of service those two things washing through the act of service this is him laying his life down for his disciples and us he's displaying to them what he was about to undergo in the process of the crucifixion. And that was that he was going to wash their filthy, dirty walk at personal cost to himself. These own towel, he was taking on the soiled things that were coming off their feet. And, and we all know that the feet, they are not the most attractive part of our body. But he says, with desire... With desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you. I've been looking forward to this occasion for such a long time. I, I've been really looking forward to washing your feet. Is that how we feel? I want to do this for you. I want to forgive you. But I can only do this if you let me. I need you to work with me on this. I need you to give me your feet. Give me that, that soil. Well, let's work together on this. And so what happens? Verse 6. Then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter saith unto him, Lord, no way, he says. Are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I do now, you probably don't understand this. You, you know not. But 
you're going to actually think back to this occasion and you're going to understand what I'm actually doing. Let me tell you what he didn't say when he came to Peter. He didn't say, oh, for goodness sake, Peter. Look, all, your, all the other disciples here, all your friends here, they have happily let me wash their feet and here we go again. Why is it always you? He didn't say that at all. He was very, very gentle and he's very understanding and he says, I know you're not going to understand this, Peter, but you will in the future. You'll get it. And Peter said to him, verse 18, no, not going to happen. You will never wash my feet. Now Jesus, I think he gets a little bit firm and says, now Peter, if I wash thee not, you have no part in me. Meaning, you have no share. You cannot share the kingdom of God with me. If I don't wash you, ESP says, you have no share with me at all. No portion, no part of eternity. You imagine the scene. Just try and picture the scene. Here's the king of the world sitting at Peter's feet and he's sitting on the ground. He's got a bowl in front of him. He's got the towel in his hand. Everybody's watching this discussion. There's Peter sitting on his little couch with his feet drawn up under him saying, you're not going to do this. I won't allow you to do this. He's probably being honourable in his own mind. And there's Christ sitting there. His hands are ready to go, dripping with water from the, the last pair of feet. And he's having this conversation with saying, Peter, you've got to let this happen. And he's saying to Peter this. This is all figurative language. He's saying, if I don't wash your feet, you have no forgiveness of sins. That's actually the essence of what's being said here. There is no forgiveness of sins if I cannot wash your feet. Do you know, every Sunday, when Christ's disciples come together in 2022, we keep the feast and we do exactly this. We understand what he is doing for you and I. And there's something else that, he, he need, that we need to know. It's not a grudging act. He's pleading with Peter. Come on, Peter. I want to do this for you. This is not reluctance on Christ's part. He really does want to do this. With desire, I've desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. So what happens then? Peter automatically sees a bit of a picture and says, oh, well, in that case, um, he says, verse, verse 9, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, he that is washed needs not save to wash his feet but is clean every whit, and ye are clean, but not all. Now what on earth is John saying here? He's saying this, Weymouth says, anyone who has recently bathed does not need to wash more than his feet, but is clean all over. And you, my disciples, are all clean, and yet that is not true of all of you. So Peter has just said, wash all of me. And Christ says to Peter, Peter, I don't need to do that. You've actually been baptised. You're totally washed. I, 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 need to, I need to wash your feet periodically in the process of forgiveness. You don't need to keep being rebaptized. And you're all clean except one of you. For he knew, verse 11, who should betray him. That's why he said, you are not all clean. And by the way, when Jesus Christ came to a pair of feet and attached to those feet were two legs and a body in the face of Judas, he didn't take his bowl and look up and go, next. He washed his feet like all the others and he knew exactly what Judas was about to do. How do we go with that? How do you go forgiving someone in your heart when you know probably, actually, they're not really interested in forgiveness at all and they're about to go ahead and harm you majorly? What a challenge that is for a human being with the carnal mind. You see, this is all about forgiveness. 
washing away of sin. True, genuine service in this context, brothers and sisters, is all about forgiveness. With that, let's stay with Weymouth. So verse, verse 12 says this. So, so after he had washed their feet, put on his garments again and returned to the table, he said to them, now, he said, do you understand what I have done to you? Do you get this? You call me rabbi and master, and rightly so, for such as I am. So I am your master. Now he says, if I then your master, if I can do that as your master, and I've washed your feet, it's also your duty to forgive one another, wash others' feet. For I have set you an example in order that you may do what I have done to you to each other. So the ultimate act of service with one another, brothers and sisters, is forgiveness. That's the ultimate act of service. And that makes you a living sacrifice. A living sacrifice. Because you are putting to death the inherentness of the carnal mind which says, I will not forget or forgive. You are suppressing that and you are offering a sacrifice to the God of heaven and earth and he is very pleased with that act. It's total, it's free and it is not earned. Your forgiveness is not earned or won, it's a gift. And the same when you give that to other brothers and sisters. When Christ come to, a, as we said before, this particular pair of feet with Judas attached to it, there was no difference. It was exactly the same. Our gift, our free gift to each other is forgiveness between ourselves. It's our service to one another. And it's a service which can only be brought or bought out of appreciation. It's a service that involves a death. And so that's why Paul says we die daily. We are suppressing the carnal mind. It's a death of our natural inclination to hold a grudge. I have set you an example in order that you may do what I have done to you. What a wonderful man. What a incredible character he was. And Paul says this in Ephesians 4 as we wrap our thoughts up for this morning. He says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamour and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be ye kind one to another tender hearted forgiving one another even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you